Great, so I think I'm going to start. Thank you to the Architecture Foundation for asking me to read tonight. This is Bedtime Stories. And a special thank you to Alicia for asking um, me to do this tonight. Um, I'm going to read The Lonely City by Olivia Lang. Uh, I have, I'm Pooja Agrawal, I'm an architect and an urbanist. And I've always been really interested in cities and in uh, like super hyper urban cities. I've lived in Mumbai and um, that's where I grew up. I moved to London when I was about 16 and then for a brief period of time I lived in New York. I've always been interested in sort of culture that explores themes of loneliness in, in cities and uh, be it sort of books like Paul Oster um, wrote a lot about it and sort of films, theatre, poetry and, and I think in the present time I feel with lockdown loneliness is something that's really been on my mind um, all our kind of communal spaces have sort of been taken away from us be it the, our pubs, our high streets and no matter whatever if you're living on your own or if you're even living with your family everyone's situation is completely unique and I think the feeling of loneliness is very very valid uh, so I've chosen to read um, an ex excerpt from Olivia Lang's Lonely City that she um so she's a writer critic that also lived in New York for a brief period and explored the theme of loneliness through um four different artists through Warhol, um Hopper, Daga and Rashonovics, and kind of explores how these artists use the theme loneliness in their process. Uh, and the reason I've chosen to look at Daga in more detail is that he was a non-artist, so he was never celebrated as an artist when he was actually um, painting or writing and all his work was sort of discovered much later on. He was a janitor and again when we're thinking about our sort of key workers at the moment that the, the people who fall through the cracks have been um, sort of on my mind and how you know how you these people are uncovered in the city and finally this part of the book also looks at attachment theory and I'm a recently a new mother and have been thinking a lot about that. So uh, I'm gonna go for it. The realms of the unreal. It's funny, subletting, making a life among someone else's things, in a home that someone else has created and long since left. My bed was on a platform up three wooden steps, so steep I had to pick my way down them backwards like a sailor. There was a boarded up window at the end that opened onto an air shaft through which music and conversation would periodically drift and stick. A dumbbell tenement, the kind described in low life, Luc Santé's incanatory account of old New York. People had been coming and going through those rooms for years, leaving jars of lip balms and tubes of hand cream in their wake. The kitchen cupboards were filled with half-finished boxes of granola and yogi tea bags, and no one had watered the plants or dusted the shelves in months. During the day, I rarely accounted anyone in the building, but at night, I'd hear doors opening and closing, people passing a few feet from my bed. The man who lived in the next apartment was a DJ, and at odd hours of the day and night, waves of bass would come surging through the walls, reverberating in my chest. At two or three in the morning, the heat rose clanking through the pipes, and just before dawn, I'd sometimes be woken by the siren of the ladder truck leaving the East 2nd Street firehouse, which had lost six crew members on 9-11. Everything felt permeable, silted up like a room without a lock or a cavern, periodically inundated by the sea. I slept shallowly, often getting up to check my email and then sprawling aimlessly on the couch, watching the sky turn from black to inky blue above the fire escape, the chase bank on the corner. There was a psychic a few doors down and on sunny afternoons she'd sit in the window of her room beside a model skull, sometimes rapping on the glass and beckoning me in, no matter how violently I shook my head. No bad data, no revelations about the future, thanks. I didn't want to know who I might or might not meet, what was lying in wait ahead. It was becoming increasingly easy to see how people ended up vanishing in cities, 
disappearing in plain sight, retreating into their apartments because of sickness or bereavement, mental illness or the persistent unbearable burden of sadness and shyness, of not knowing how to impress themselves into the world. I was getting a taste of it, all right, but what on earth would it be like to live the whole of your life like this, occupying the blind spot in other people's existences, their noisy intimacies? If anyone can be said to have worked from that place, it's Henry Dalga, the Chicago janitor who posthumously achieved fame as one of the world's most celebrated outsider artists, a term coined to describe people on the margins of society who make work without the benefit of an education in art or art history. Dalga, who was born in the slums of Chicago in 1892, had certainly existed on the margins. His mother had died of puerperal fever when he was four, a few days after giving birth to his sister, who was immediately adopted. His father was crippled, and at the age of eight he was sent away, first to a Catholic boys' home, and then to an Illinois asylum for feeble-minded children, where he received the dreadful news that his father was dead. After running away at 17, he found work in the city's Catholic hospitals, in which uncertain refuge he spent nearly six decades rolling bandages and sweeping floors. In 1932, Dargo rented a single room on the second floor of a boarding house at 851 Webster Street in a run-down working-class region of the city. There he stayed until 1972, when he became too ill to care for himself and so went unwillingly to the St. Augustine Catholic Mission, where coincidentally his father had also died. After he moved out, his landlord, Nathan Lerner, decided to clean the room of 40 years of accumulated rubbish. He hired a skip and asked another tenant, David Berglin, to assist him by driving out piles of newspaper. Old shoes, broken eyeglasses and empty bottles, the collected hoardings of a devoted dumpster diver. At some point during this process, Berglin began to unearth artworks of almost supernatural radiance beautiful, baffling watercolours of naked little girls with penises at play in rolling landscapes. Some had charming fairy tale elements, clouds with faces and winged creatures sporting in the sky. Others were exquisitely staged in coloured scenes of mass torture, complete with delicately painted pools of scarlet blood. Berglin showed them to Lerner, himself an artist, who immediately recognised their value. Over the next few months, they discovered a vast body of work, including over 300 paintings and thousands of pages of written material. Much of it was set in a coherent other world, the realms of the unreal, a place Dargo inhabited far more dynamically and passionately than he did the everyday city of Chicago. Many people live constricted lives, but what is astonishing about Dargo is the compensatory scale as well as richness of his eternal sphere. He had begun writing about the realm sometime between 1910 and 1912 after he escaped from the asylum, though who knows how long he'd been thinking about it or visiting it in his mind. The story of the Vivian girls in what is known as the realms of the unreal, of the glando Angelican war storm caused by the Child Slave Rebellion, would eventually run to 15,145 pages, making it the longest known work of fiction in existence. As the unwieldy title suggests, The Realms of the Unreal charts the progress of a bloody civil war. It takes place on an imaginary planet around which our own Earth circulates as a moon. Like its American counterpart, this war is being fought over slavery, specifically the slavery of children. In fact, the role of children is among the most striking elements of the work. While gorgeously attired adult men fight on either side, the spiritual leaders of the struggle against the wicked Glandelians are seven prepubescent sisters, while the victims of the multiple atrocities are small girl children, often stripped of their clothes, revealing the presence of male genitals. The Vivian girls are endlessly resilient, like comic book heroes, Heroines, they can withstand any amount of violence, escaping every peril. But the other children are not so lucky. As both the written and visual material makes graphically clear, the realms are a place of infinite cruelty, 
in which naked little girls are routinely strangled, crucified and disemboweled by uniformed men in gardens filled with luscious outsized flowers. It is this element of the work that would later draw accusations of sexual sadism and paedophilia. Over the years, Daga also wrote a second enormous novel, Crazy House, Further Adventures in Chicago, as well as an autobiography and multiple journals. But despite his astonishing productivity, he apparently never tried to show, promote or even talk about his work, making and containing it within a succession of three small boarding house rooms. As such, it's not perhaps surprising that when Berglund went to St. Augustine Mission to ask about the thrilling find at Webster Street, Dalga refused to discuss it, making the enigmatic statement, it's too late now, and asking that the word be, work be destroyed. Later, he contradicted himself, saying that it would be preserved in learner's custody. Either way, when he died on 13 April 1973, at the age of 81, he left behind no explanation for the things he'd made, the art he'd created so painstakingly over so many years. In the absence of any surviving relatives, it was Lerner and his wife who took on the roles of advocate and champion, coordinating and driving Daga's growing status in the art world and selling his increasingly costly paintings to private collectors, galleries and museums. It's rare that a body of work emerges into view so totally severed from its maker and is particularly problematic when the content is both so disturbing and so resistant to interpretation. In the 40 years since Dalga's death, theories about his intentions and character have proliferated but put forward by an impassioned chorus of art historians, academics, curators, psychologists and journalists. These voices are by no means convergent but broadly speaking, they've established Daga as an outsider artist, non pareil, untutored, ignorant, isolated, and almost certainly mentally ill. The extreme violence and physically explicit nature of his work has inevitably drawn lurid readings. Over the years, he's been posthumously diagnosed with autism and schizophrenia, while his first biographer, John McGregor, explicitly suggested that he possessed the mind of a paedophile or serial killer an accusation that's proved enduring. It seemed to me that this second act of Daga's life compounded the isolation of the first, divesting him of dignity and drowning out or speaking over the voice he'd managed to raise against considerable odds. The things he had made have served as lightning rods for other people's fears and fantasies about isolations, its potentially pathological aspect in fact, many of the books and articles written about him seem to shine more light on our cultural anxieties around the effects of loneliness on the psyche than they do on the artist as a real breathing person. This process troubled me so much, in fact, that I became obsessed with accessing and reading the history of my life, Daga's own published, unpublished memoir. Some of its texts has been reproduced, but not in its entirety, another form of silencing particularly when one considers how many volumes have been published on his life. After some digging, I discovered that the manuscript was in New York, along with Daga's written work and many of his drawings, part of a collection purchased from the learners in the 1990s by the American Folk Art Museum. I wrote to the curator asking if I could visit, and she agreed to let me spend a week, the maximum concession, reading through his papers, the words he'd actually used to record his existence to the world. I'm just going to skip a few pages where she goes through um, his memoirs to another bit. In my lunch breaks, I used to walk down to the waterfront and sit by the river. There was a carousel on the promenade, a real beauty, and as I ate, I could hear the shouts of children being whirled around on the painted wooden ponies, chestnut, black and bay. Daga's phrase about the asylum had lodged in my mind, and as I sat there, I worried over it. It was home to me is a statement that cuts to a central issue in loneliness studies, the question of attachment. Attachment theory was developed in the 50s and the 60s by the British psychologist, psychoanalyst John Bowlby and the development psychologist Mary Ainsworth. It proposes that children need to form secure emotional attachments with the caretaker during infancy and early childhood, a process that contributes to their later emotional and social development and that if ruptured or otherwise insufficient, can have lasting consequences. This sounds like common sense. By the time of Daga's childhood, the consensus among healthcare providers of all kinds, from psychoanalysts
doctors was that all children required in the way of nourishment was a germ-free environment and a ready supply of food. The reigning belief was that tenderness and physical affection were actively detrimental to development and could in fact ruin a child. To modern ears this seems insane, but it was driven by a genuine desire to improve child survival. In the 19th century, child mortality had been enormously high, especially in institutions like hospitals and orphanages. Once germ transmission was understood, the preferred strategy of care was to maintain hygiene by minimising physical contact, moving beds apart and limiting interactions with parents, staff and other patients as much as possible. While this did indeed successfully reduce the spread of disease, it also had an unexpected consequence, which took decades to be properly understood. In the newly sterile conditions, children failed to thrive. They were physically more healthy, and yet they wasted away, particularly the infants. Isolated and untouched, they went through paroxysms of grief, rage and despair, before eventually submitting passively to their state. Stiff, polite, apathetic and emotionally withdrawn, their behaviour made them easy to neglect, further entrenching them in acute, unspeakable loneliness and isolation. As a discipline, psychology was at this stage in its infancy and the majority of practitioners either refused or were unable to see a problem. This was after all the era of the behavioural psychologist B.F. Skinner who believed babies should be raised in boxes protected from the contaminating presence of the mother and of John Watson, president of the American Psychological Association, who mooted bringing up infants in hygienic camps in accordance with scientific principles and far from the damaging influence of their doting parents. Nonetheless, a handful of practitioners in America and Europe, among them Baldwin Ainsworth, Rene Spitz and Harry Harlow, had a strong instinct that what these institutionalised children were suffering was from loneliness and what they were pining for was love, in particular affectionate physical contact from a stable and consistent caregiver. They began to carry out research in hospitals and orphanages on both sides of the Atlantic, but these studies were dismissed as being too small, too easily misconstrued. It took Harry Harlow's infamous experiments with rhesus monkeys in the late 50s to really make the case for love. Anyone who's seen photograph of Harlow's monkeys clinging to wire models or huddled in isolation chambers will know that these are deeply disturbing experiments carried out in an uneasy hinterland between the scientifically valid and the ethically abhorrent. Changing the treatment of human children mattered to Harlow. For him, the monkeys were simply collateral damage in a larger battle. Like Bowlby, what he was trying to do was prove the crucial importance of affection and social connection. Many of his findings tally with current research on loneliness, particularly the notion that isolation leads to a decline in social sophistication, which in itself elicits further episodes of rejection. In the first of his attachment experiments carried out at the University of Wisconsin in 1957, he separated infant rhesus monkeys from their mothers, providing them with a pair of surrogates, one made of wire and one wrapped in soft cloth. In half the cages, a bottle of milk was attached to the chest of the wire mothers and in the other half to the cloth mothers. According to the dominant theories of the time, the infant monkeys should have selected whichever surrogate possessed the food. But in fact, they exhibited an absolute preference for the cloth mother, clinging to her whether she had milk or not, and only darting to the wire mother to suckle before racing back. Next, Harlow assessed the reactions of the infants to various kinds of stress. He gave another group access to either a wire or cloth mother before introducing a barking toy dog and a marching clockwork bear beating a drum. Monkeys who only had access to the wire mothers were far more alarmed by these terrifying apparitions than those provisioned with the more comforting cloth bodies. These results align with the later work of Mary Ainsworth, who in the 1960s explored how children's abilities to handle stressful or threatening situations depends on how securely they are attached. It was Ainsworth who came up with the categorisation still in use today, formulating a distinction between secure or insecure attachment, 
the latter which can be further subdivided into ambivalent and avoidant attachment. An ambivalently attached child is distressed by maternal absence and shows its feeling via a mixture of anger, desire for contact and passivity. While an avoidantly attached child withholds their reactions on the mother's return, masking the intensity of grief and fear. Together, these experiments show the intensity of the need an infant has for an attachment figure. Harlow, however, still wasn't satisfied that his work was emphatic enough. For his next experiment, he designed four so-called monster mothers. Each possessed a comforting clock body, but they were also armed respectively with brass spikes, an air blaster, an ability to fling their charge away or to rock it so violently you could hear the baby monkey's teeth clashing together. Despite the discomfort, the infants kept clinging on, willing to face even pain in their quest for affection, for something soft to cuddle up to. It was the image of these monster mothers that had come back to me when I read Darga's statement about loving the asylum. The bleak truth Harlow's experiments reveals is that a child's need for attachment far outweighs its capacity for self-protection, something that is also apparent when abused children plead to stay with violent parents. I can't say whether I was actually sorry I ran away from the state farm or not, but now I believe I was the sort of fool to have done so. Darga had written in his memoir. My life was like in a sort of heaven there. Do you think I might be fool enough to run away from heaven if I get there? Heaven, a place in which during his own time children were regularly beaten, raped and abused. But the monster mothers wasn't the only experiment of Harlow's to illuminate a key aspect of Darga's life. In the late 60s, after he won the National Medal of Science, Harlow turned his attention from mothering to what happens to an infant if there's no social interaction whatsoever. He was becoming increasingly aware that it wasn't just attachment to the mother that produced a socially and emotionally healthy infant, but rather a whole mosaic of relationships. He wanted to understand the role of social contact in development and to see what effects a forced experience of loneliness would produce. In the first horrifying round of isolation experiments, he placed newborn rhesus monkeys in solitary confinement, some for a month, some for six months, and some for an entire year. Even the monkeys with the shortest sentence emerged from their prisons emotionally disturbed, while those who were isolated for a full year were incapable of exploration of sexual relations, engaging instead in repeated patterns of behavior, huddling, licking, and self-clutching. They were aggressive or withdrawn, they rocked or paced back and forth. They sucked their fingers and toes. They froze into fixed positions or repeated strange gestures of the hand and arm. Again, it reminded me of Henry, the compulsive noise making, the repetitive movements he made with his left hand. Harlow wanted to see what would happen if these previously isolated individuals were returned to a group environment. The results were devastating. When placed in the sh shared enclosure, they were almost invariably bullied while some aggressively approached larger individuals in what Harlow termed suicidal aggressions. It was so bad in fact that some had to be re-isolated to keep them from being killed. In Harlow's book, The Human Model, the chapter that deals with these experiments is titled The Hell of Loneliness. If only this were confined to rhesus monkeys. But humans are social creatures too and also tend to cast out individuals who do not fit easily into the group. People who are not socially fluent, who have not been given a loving training in how to play and engage, how to join in and situate themselves, are far more likely to elicit inst instances of rejection. One might think here of Valerie Salonis, fresh from prison, being spat out by strangers in the street. For me, this is the most disturbing aspect of Harlow's work, the revelation that after an experience of loneliness, both the damaged individual and the healthy society work in concert to maintain separation. More recent, recent research, particularly with bullied children, suggests that the target of social rejection are often those who are deemed either too aggressive or too anxious and withdrawn. Unhappily, these are precisely the behaviours that arise from insecure or inadequate attachment. <laughs>
or from early episodes of isolation. What this means in practice is that children who have had problematic attachment experiences are far more likely to suffer episodes of rejection than their peers. Establishing patterns of loneliness and withdrawal that can continue entrenching well into adulthood. This pattern too plays out in Daga's life. The lacks and losses he suffered in his childhood are precisely those that shatter attachment, kindling chronic loneliness. What happens next is the grim old cycle of hypervigilance. The growth of defensiveness and suspicion, a note audible everywhere else in the memoir. He perpetually revisits all disagreements with people from his past, ways in which they cheated him or let him down. I hate my accusers and would have liked to kill them, but did not dare. I never was their friend and am their enemy yet, even whether they are dead now or not. The impression is of someone profoundly lacking in social flexibility, someone routinely picked on, ostracised or bullied, locked into the self-defeating circuit of suspicion and mistrust, which follows on from any substantial experience of self-isolation or shattered bonds. But what the psychological account of loneliness elides, elides in is the part taken by society in self in policing and perpetuating exclusion, rejecting the unwieldy and strange. This is the other driver of loneliness, the reason why certain people, often the most vulnerable and needy of connection, find themselves permanently on the threshold, if not cast entirely beyond the pale. Thank you. I hope that hasn't been too doom and gloom. I encourage you all to reach out to someone you love or care or your maybe just your strange neighbour and say hello and good night. Thank you very much.